Great. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. Um, my name again is Robert Hayes. I want to thank the friends of the Tewksbury Library, along with the Ashland Public Library, uh, for helping us out today. Uh, today's program, A Trip to Cornwall, England with the Traveling Librarian. Uh, join Jeff Claps, the Traveling Librarian, for another of his popular armchair travel presentations. This series highlights travel photography and stories and travel tips about destinations around the world. This month, journey to the rugged southwest corner of England. Cornwall is smaller than Rhode Island, but packed with historic castles and country homes, charming fishing villages, and dramatic rocky coastline that are perfect for hiking. Uh, and in the middle is the atmospheric Bodmin Moor, uh, full of legends, prehistoric sites, and windswept landscapes. And Jeff, of course, is the recently retired head of reference services at the BB Memorial Library in Wakefield, and he's an avid traveler and photographer. So all 100 of us, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Jeff for joining <laughs> us here this afternoon. And Jeff, you can take it away. Thanks so thank much. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Um, and thank you all for joining me on this kind of glum afternoon, which um, coincidentally is extremely Cornish in um, in atmosphere, so it's kind of a perfect day to be um, pretending to go to Cornwall. Um, as he said, um, I'm I'm going to keep an eye on questions as we go through the program, so feel free to put them in the Q and A. If I miss any, we'll do it at the end. Um, and I did put my email again, uh, jeffclapes at gmail dot com, uh, into the chat. Uh, if after the program is over, I'm always happy to talk to people by email. If you have any questions about this program or any other general travel questions that I can help with, I'm happy to talk to you uh, later. So let's get started. Um, and oh, I need to share my screen. There we go. I hope that looks good. Um, this is a uh, trip that I took actually very close to uh, right before COVID hit and everything locked down. So this is actually kind of the last international trip that I took um, before the world changed. Um, and whoop, where's my mouse? There we go. Um, so this was in 2000, late 2019. And the, the red thing that you can see here is the route that we took at that point. We're only today going to be talking about just this little bit down at, way at the end, uh, which is Cornwall. We also went through Devon, um, and Somerset and even Oxfordshire. And the main reason for all of that was um, that we have friends in most of those places. So it was an opportunity not to not only to do some fun sightseeing, uh, but also to visit a number of friends that we don't get to see very often who live in different parts of southeastern, uh, or southwestern rather, England. Um, you may have noticed, if you haven't been living under a rock, um, that England has been a little bit in the news the past week or so. Um, we're not talking about the Queen, um, but um, it's probably appropriate that um, we're visiting uh, England at this particular time um, to kind of in solidarity think about what a beautiful country it is. I do have uh, separate programs for Somerset, Dorset, and Oxfordshire. Um, if you're ever interested, let Robert know, um, and we could certainly do those maybe at some time in the future. But to put it on the map, I just want you to kind of have an idea of where we're going and, and geographically how it is. Um, the blue thing, blue blob that you can see is a rough outline of Massachusetts just for size. Cornwall is actually very, very small, um, despite how well known it is in, um, in the travel world. It's only about the size of Rhode Island. Um, and if you drive from the border in Devon all the way west to Land's End, it's only about 75 miles. Um, and it's a relatively small county uh, in England with only about uh, half a million people, um, which means it's one of, by, by population at least, it's one of the smaller counties in, um, in England. Um, and here's a close up showing you the actual border. Um, it's bounded on the east by Devon. Um, and the capital is Truro, which is very small. It's only about, I think, 20,000 people. Um, but of course, uh, as you might imagine, Cornwall has an extremely um, distinct and proud heritage uh, that is unique um, in Britain. And they even have their own language, uh, Cornish, 
which um, is actually hardly evident when you travel around. It's not like going to Brittany in France where the Breton language is alive and well, or um, traveling to Wales, for example, where Welsh is extremely widely spoken. Um, Cornish has really almost disappeared. There's only a few hundred speakers left um, in, in the entire area. And, and unlike Wales, you won't see a lot of uh, signs that have dual languages and so forth. Um, Cornish just has really not uh, not kept up with um, the other kinds of uh, regional languages that are elsewhere still uh, alive and well in Europe. We're going to start in the north on the north coast and just basically work our way all the way out to the end and then come back um, through uh, the south coast. But we're also going to stop in Bodmin Moor, which is this large green um, spot in the middle. It's a it's a national park and very, very beautiful. Um, but I have to talk about food. We always have to talk about food. Um, everywhere in Cornwall, you will find Cornish pasties. And I need to mention a little bit about those just because they're they're delicious to eat. You find them everywhere. And it's a great, um, they're great street food, a great lunch meal. Um, they're very filling meat or vegetable pies. But they have an interesting history. Cornwall has a lot of mining. And um, one of the things about tin mining, which was the, the primary uh, mining that was going on in, in Cornwall um, in past centuries, it's very dangerous. Dangerous not only because you're way underground, but also because there's a lot of um, unpleasant substances down there, one of which is arsenic. Um, and the, what uh, the miners would do is take these, uh, uh, the, the pasties, which are made of a very thick dough, um, you'll notice that they have kind of a crimped edge around um, the half moon shape. And the idea was the miners would take them out, down underground um, and they were great, uh, they were great finger food because you could hold um, you could hold the pasty with the crimped edge, which you didn't eat. You would eat everything in the middle, and then you would throw the edge away because your hands, which were very likely to have arsenic dust all over them. Um, you didn't want to eat anything that you had actually touched with your hands. So they almost had kind of a built-in handle that allowed you to eat the pasty, um, eat the good nutritious part, throw away the handle, and greatly reduce the likelihood um, of getting arsenic poisoning. Nowadays, of course, that's not an issue, um, but you can find them everywhere, and they're very delicious and um, very filling. Another food that you'll find everywhere, which is um, wonderful, particularly if you were traveling on a day like today where the weather's kind of grim, um, cream teas. They're even more famous in Devon, which is the, um, just to the east. Um, they involve homemade scones, uh, usually uh, some kind of fruit jam, often strawberry, and clotted cream, which you can see in this little container here. Um, and of course, a freshly brewed pot of tea. Um, I might horrify people to tell you that I actually really am not a tea drinker. Um, and even when I drink delicious, good tea made the proper British way, I still don't like tea. I'm a coffee drinker. Um, but I had to do it anyway. And here is a good example of what, um, uh, what a cream tea looks like. They're delicious in the afternoon, um, uh, particularly after a day of hiking or, or whatever. The, the funny thing about it is there's a very distinct difference depending on which part of the country you come from. In Cornwall, um, you cut open your scone and you put the jam on first and then you put the cream on top of it. In Devon, it's the other way around. Um, and they're very intense about that. If you're a tourist, obviously they don't care and you can get away with it and I wouldn't worry. But it is funny how um, similar to the way they're here in the United States, there are all these very interesting local um, traditions about food and drink. Um, that, of course, is very true in Britain as well. We're going to start on the northern coast um, in an area called Tintagel, um, which is one of the most popular places to visit. As you can see from this photo, we were very lucky to have fantastic weather, um, which is not always the case in Cornwall. Um, Tintagel Village is very tiny, um, but also uh, very, very touristy, um, but it still makes it worthwhile to visit it. Here's the old post office in Tintagel, which dates to the 14th century, if you can believe it or not. 
It's been turned into a nice little museum um, with a serious roofing issue. Uh, but the village is a beautiful place to stroll around um, and see the old houses. It is, as I said, kind of touristy, um, in fact, extremely touristy. Over 200,000 people visit this tiny town um, every year. Um, and it's full of little shops. Uh, it reminded me a little bit of Rockport um, here in Massachusetts, where it's very quaint, it's very cute, and it can be at certain times if you're completely overrun with tourists. There's a lot of tourist schlock um, to buy related to King Arthur, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute. So you can buy plastic Excalibur swords, all kinds of uh, uh, sort of druidy type uh, tourist stuff and all that kind of stuff. But it still makes it worthwhile to visit. The site is stunning. There are views up and down the coast uh, in both directions with very rocky headlands. Um, on top of one of which is the Camelot Hotel, which was built in 1899, has a fantastic view of the castle. Um, the Victorian era is really when this uh, site became really popular with tourists. And in fact, that's kind of when uh, mass tourism started to develop in general. And so it became a very popular location in that, um, in that era at the end of the 19th century. The, the big highlight here is the headland, uh, which is very dramatic, um, and it's where Tintagel Castle originally was located. Not much of the castle is left except some ruined foundations and walls, um, but the site is still so spectacular that um, it's certainly a no-miss if you're in the area. There's a lot of controversy surrounding the history of the site. There, there was an actual castle there. You can see the foundations. And it probably dates to about the 13th century or so um, when it was built, when it was actually built in order to reinforce um, the, the historical connection to King Arthur. Um, and that connection was started um, by a guy named Geoffrey of Monmouth, who um, tried to popularize the idea that Arthur, who may have been somewhat mythical, may have been somewhat real, um, he tried to convince the world that um, Arthur was actually conceived in this particular location. And it was a way of attracting pilgrims from around the world. And there were obviously very uh, strong economic benefits to that. How much of that is actually true um, is a subject for endless um, academic debate. Um, but regardless, the site is just gorgeous. Um, and there is whatever its historical connections may or may not have. Um, the castle is real and you can see the foundations and get an idea of what it would have been like to um, be in a fortified location on this incredible um, headland hundreds of feet above the above the water. There's a nice walking tour around it. Um, you do have to cross this chasm and in this photo, you can see the old way that you used to do that, which is a very long um, stairway down and then up again on the, the far side. Um, not long before we were there, which was in the summer of 2019, um, they opened this new bridge, a uh, steel footbridge that goes across the cap uh, chasm. Uh, a lot of people hated it. Um, and just because they felt it was ugly and too modern and and so forth. But um, the good thing about it is it does make access to the island much easier, which if you are in any way disabled or have any kind of mobility problems, um, you will certainly appreciate it because um, going down and um, up on the other side, this incredibly steep stairway um, would make it very difficult for an awful lot of people visiting there. Once you get to the top, there's some fantastic views up and down the coast. Um, and the, the walking tour, the path that goes through the site does a very good job explaining what the different parts of the, um, uh, the layout were. So you can, you can see exactly what it would have been like to be there um, when it was a, a full castle structure. Way out on the tip is this um, very atmospheric statue of King Arthur installed a few years ago. 
and he guards the headland ominously. Um, there's some interesting parts of the castle. This, um, this unassuming little uh, rectangular area is what used to be a garden enclosure um, in the original castle and some versions of the medieval romance about Tristan and Isolde, which you might be familiar with, um, are set um, not only in Tintagel, but in this exact uh, location in this garden. Um, and once you get to the top, there's a nice view down. Um, you can take the steps, uh, if you wish, all the way down to the cove, right down by the water where there's a nice little um, beach. And the cave that you can see off to the left here is called Merlin's Cave. Obviously, it's a natural cave. It has nothing to do with Merlin the Magician, um, but it makes a very fun place to explore. And it actually goes all the way through the headland. You can get all the way through to the other side. So there's a lot of fun places to explore. It's a perfect place to take kids. If you are traveling in the area with kids, um, not only does it have all kinds of fun rocks to climb up and down, but um, the connection with King Arthur, of course, is very appealing. Um, to any kids who um, have enjoyed old mythology um, and uh, old myths and legends. It is touristy. There is a large number of them hiking along the, the headland on the opposite side. Someone even brought his dog who was enjoying the water. Um, a little further down the coast, uh, we're heading west, remember, and we're going to take a little detour inland to Bodmin Moor, which is about 80 square miles or so. It's not enormous, but um, it's big enough um, to be very wild. Uh, it has a lot of granite outcrops, and one of them, which is called Rao Tor, you'll see from this slide that it's uh, it's spelled rough, but pronounced Rao. Um, and uh, the nearby um, outcropping called Brown Willy, uh, which are the highest points in Cornwall. They're about 1,400 feet. Uh, I'm just looking, I'm trying to keep an eye on the chat here. I noticed someone was asking about um, the tide coming in and flooding Merlin's cave. Yes, it does. Um, so you'd want to be careful of that if you were if you were in that area. Uh, what happened to my, I want to bring up the um, Q&A. There we go. Okay. And um, Bodmin Moor is just a wonderful place to explore nature and uh, just get out a little bit into the open. It's very wild, very windswept, and very, very old. Um, it has been inhabited since Neolithic times, so um, you will see remnants of that. We'll look at a couple of those. Um, but there are also uh, domestic animals, sheep, cows, horses, like you can see here. Um, and also a lot of untamed wildlife that, that um, is around here. It is not forested. It's very open, very windswept. Um, and it is one of those places that looks deceptively safe. Um, in general, it's a very nice place to hike. It is very safe. But the weather can change very drastically, very quickly. Um, in fact, um, it's funny. I um, Facebook today reminded me as it does that um, exactly three years ago today, I was hiking um, in this exact spot and um, I had some fun videos of the, what must have been 50 mile an hour winds whipping across the landscape. Um, and it was freezing cold, even though the sun was shining. Um, and fog can quickly come in, storms can quickly come in. So you do have to be, uh, if you're traveling um, and hiking in this area, you do wanna make sure that um, you are aware of the weather conditions and take water and take warm clothing because um, you don't want to get stuck out here late at night um, and find that all of a sudden it's dark and you can't find your way back to your car. Um, what you're seeing here is a lot of very strange rock formations, mostly granite. Um, and there are some Iron Age stone circles as well. I'll show you a couple of those. But most of the formations that you're seeing in this series of photographs are actually entirely natural. These are not man-made. They're granite outcrops that were weathered by the elements, primarily wind and water, um, over the millennia into these uh, bizarre formations. 
They're also deceptively um, larger than, than you would think. The scale is a little bit misleading. Um, here's a human being here uh, for comparison. If you have watched, um, there's a really nice adaptation of um, the famous novel by Daphne du Maurier, who um, of course is very, very much connected to Cornwall. Um, she wrote a uh, novel called Jamaica Inn, uh, which was made into, uh, I believe it was a BBC miniseries with I think three episodes um, and maybe 10 years ago or so, 10, 15 years ago. Um, it stars um, one of the one of the daughters, uh, uh, the actress who played one of the daughters in Downton Abbey, and it's actually a very well done adaptation, fairly close to the book. Um, and both the novel and that um, adaptation of the novel um, are have a very dramatic scene at the very end of the story that takes place um, on this site, this particular um, outcropping. And the film version is actually filmed here. Um, so if you have a chance to see it, it's um, it's it's very it's very Cornish. There's um, there's smuggling in a mysterious inn, and it's it's very gothic. Um, so I would recommend it if you like that kind of thing. And of course, once you get to the top, there are views all over. You can actually see um, the ocean on in both directions, both north and south. Um, and again, these formations that you can see in the back that look like um, they are ancient walls are entirely natural. Um, the other bump that you can see off in the distance is called Brown Willie. Um, it's about a mile or so away um, and is technically the highest point in Cornwall by, uh, by a few feet um, over the one that we're on now. We ended up deciding not to go hiking over there, even though it's not that far, just because the wind was so incredibly cold um, that we gave up. <laughs> Just said, I think we've seen enough of Bodmin Moor at this point, um, but the views are are really wonderful. Here I am trying to not get blown off the top of a rock. Um, someone's asking about the tourism here, whether it's mostly domestic tourists. Um, or international tourists. And there's there's certainly a mix of both. Uh, we were there in the fall. Um, and um, there were certain, there's, there's plenty of um, British tourists there because it's a beautiful part of their country and they would travel there the same way um, Americans would go to New England to see the foliage in the fall. It's a, it's a beautiful historic part of their country. Um, but there are also plenty of um foreign tourists as well although i wouldn't say i wouldn't say there were as many as i have seen in other my other travels around europe um cornwall is not like going to rome or paris um so you will see some foreign tourists but i would say the majority that i saw were probably domestic tourists um but again that was i don't know how representative that is because i was only there for um about two weeks in one particular fall um, and yes, again, the, the formations that you're seeing uh, are granite, which is very hard rock. Um, but um, because of their exposure and because of the lack of trees, um, they are very exposed to both wind and water um, in the form of rain. So um, they are weathered um, and worn down because of that over, um, over the millennia. And we did run into plenty of horses and sheep it's a very typical British uh, rural landscape. Um, the horses are not wild. Um, they are domestic horses, but they do have the run of Bodmin Moor. So um, uh, much as you might see in the Western United States, they are not limited to a, a, a small area. They actually have um, an enormous area to, to roam around in. And, um, and graze. Right and smack in the center of Bodmin Moor is the famous Jamaica Inn that is connected with Daphne du Maurier's novel. Um, the current building that you see here is from 1750, although there was a coaching inn 
on this site um, as far back as a couple hundred years earlier into the 1500s for travelers who were crossing the moor. It's uh, crossing the moor obviously is very dangerous um, when, uh, unless it's today where you have a modern vehicle and you can cross it in about 30 minutes. Um, back in the old days, it was dangerous. There were robbers, there was horrible weather. You could get stuck out there in the dark. Um, so it's roughly circular and this inn is more or less in the middle, smack in the middle. Um, and it made a safe place to stay if you were crossing the moor um, back in the old days. Um, it's long been associated with smuggling and that's what inspired uh, Daphne du Maurier's famous novel, which was also made into a Hitchcock film um, and the adaptation that I mentioned that's a little bit more recent from within the last 10 years or so. You can stay in it. Um, you can eat it. It has a great, um, uh, nice restaurant. It is a little touristy now. Obviously, it's um, it's enjoying the notoriety um, and the connection to the novel. Um, so they have a gift shop, but they do have all the creature comforts. It is no longer, um, if you've if you've read the novel or seen any of the the film versions, um, it is uh, they have all the mod cons. Um, so it's a, actually a quite nice place to stay if you want to um, stay in a historic location in the middle of a very atmospheric um, wild area. You can also, of course, buy plenty of copies of the book in the gift shop. Um, it is a wild area, so there's a lot of um, wildlife. Uh, we didn't see any otters, but um, there are supposed to be some in this area. Um, I want to show you quickly a couple of Neolithic sites um, in Bodmin Moor. Um, there's, there's several, actually, um, and this one uh, called the Hurler Stone Circle is not far from the village on, on the southern edge of the moor near the village of Minions. Um, and the name comes from uh, a legend of old giants who were actually hurling the stones um, and hurling each other, and they ended up turning into standing stones. Um, it's estimated that this circle is, a, is several thousand years old. It's not quite as dramatic as something like Stonehenge, um, but it is very similar in, in its design um, and still pretty impressive. Another very uh, important site uh, not too far from there is called Trevethi Coit, um, which is also probably around 3500 BC. Um, this was a tomb and was originally covered with earth. You can see that the rocks um, uh, are arranged in kind of a wall formation with uh, an enclosed space inside that's covered by this enormous um, 10 ton capstone. Um, that sits on top of them. Uh, the whole structure is about nine feet high. What you can't see from this photograph is that it's actually right behind someone's house um, in a very suburban neighborhood, which is kind of funny. Um, but um, originally, this would have been covered with earth, and you would have had to go through a small tunnel to get into the chamber, um, which would have been hidden from view. Um, the earth has long since eroded away, and all that's left now is the um, the standing stones. There's also a number of industrial ruins in this area, mostly connected with the tin mining, which was very important in the late 18th and, um, and 19th centuries in Cornwall. Um, a beautiful spot to stop, um, again, down kind of on, we're on the southern uh, edge of Bodmin Moor, is a beautiful little town um, with a parish church uh, called St. Neot's Church, um, and this village, uh, the, ch the church in the village was built in the uh, 15th century and is particularly known for its exquisite stained glass, which dates from the very earliest period of the church in the 15th century and the century after that. Um, the church itself is also quite beautiful. Um, one of the crosses here um, was purportedly given by King Alfred uh, to St. Neot when he visited the village in the late 800s. Um, and so that's where um, 
uh, St. Neot is who the village is, is named after. But you can see how um, very atmospheric and very old this village is, along with many other villages in Cornwall. Um, a more recent tomb, on, here's, I felt bad for this poor man who's known as Matthew Crapp, um, and it's been memorialized on his tombstone. The inside of the church is gorgeous. Um, and in fact, so many people visit the, the major cathedrals throughout Britain, which of course are worth a visit. Um, but I think often people forget that there are so many beautiful small parish churches um, that also have exquisite architecture and a lot of um, incredible history and beautiful detailing inside this one. Um, this church has this wooden rood screen inside that's uh, carved, uh, carved oak. Uh, it's undated, but you can see just how incredibly detailed uh, the Gothic design is. Uh, the creation window, which is in the east um, of the church, is one of the earliest windows in the church. And the village itself is just a, a beautiful little spot to stop. Um, they have a nice general store. Um, and there's a pleasant walk in the surroundings of the village, um, not far from the church that takes you to a well, St. Neot's Miraculous Well, which supposedly, according to the legend, um, contained three fish. And he was told that um, the, the fish would never decrease if he only took one fish per day um, out of the well. There would all, they would always be replenished and there would always be a continuous supply of food. Um, of course, at some point, somebody must have taken more than one fish, so now there's no fish in the well. Um, but it's a beautiful spot to stroll along the river. Um, not far from here is um, what I consider a highlight of the region, Len Hydrock. Um, it's probably the best known and biggest of the country houses um, in this area. It's a National Trust property, um, as you might imagine. Um, and it's uh, a bit of Downton Abbey, um, but for real. Um, it's in fact one of the largest houses in all of Southwest England. So if you like visiting stately homes, um, this is one to stop at. In fact, I would say if you only want to visit one, I would make it Lan Hydrock. Um, the name refers to St. Hydrock. And the property goes back hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, but the, the current house that you see here dates from the 1600s. And then it was extensively rebuilt in the late 19th century because there was a, a major fire that destroyed significant parts of the property. So it was rebuilt in the same style um, only about 150 years ago. Um, there's also gorgeous gardens and about 900 acres of uh, both formal gardens and informal um, British style uh, woods and uh, woodland paths and so forth that you can explore if you have the time. The house itself is U-shaped um, and you enter through a, um, the original gatehouse and through this formal courtyard. Here's the main entrance. The, these sort of eggplant looking um, topiary are um, line, the, line the main entrance walkway. The gatehouse that you can see here was built in the 1650s originally as a hunting lodge, but now it serves as the main entrance to the home. And the north wing, uh, which is on the right as, as, um, as you enter the property, is the only part of the original 1600s house that really survived the fire mostly intact. And I just want to call attention to the second uh, story here with these huge windows, um, which is called the Long Hall. You'll see the inside of that in just a minute. Um, the interior has about 50 rooms that you can explore, most of which are in the high Victorian style because, again, they were rebuilt and decorated in the late 19th century when high Victorian was popular. Um, it's, um, in addition to just being a beautiful house, if you enjoy the whole upstairs, downstairs aspect of shows like Downton Abbey and, and upstairs, downstairs, for that matter. 
um, it's it's a nice way to see what um, how a house like this would have actually run um, in that uh, in the the heyday um, when they had um, huge numbers of servants both inside and outside the house. Most of the house, like the dining room that you can see here, has been kind of redesigned in a Jacobean revival style. So this isn't original to the 1600s. It's a mix of um, trying to duplicate that time period and with an, uh, kind of a mix of arts and crafts, William Morris style. If you note the wallpaper, um, very much looks like um, late 19, uh, late 19th century, early, early 20th century arts and crafts movement. Um, and William Morris, who was obviously very important in uh, England at the time, um, had a lot of influence in this house. Um, and you can see that in a lot of the wallpapers and the furnishings. Um, surprisingly, it's actually kind of a modest house. This isn't like visiting Versailles. It isn't like visiting um, Windsor Castle or even some of the fantastic houses in Newport here in, in New England. Most of the rooms are relatively modest in size for a castle. Um, this is his lordship's bedroom. Um, which is not terribly large, although I have to point out the wallpaper is a copy um, of some paper in the House of Lords. So um, there is that. Um, and this is his bathroom. Uh, her ladyship had an equally beautiful room, and this is her boudoir. The family drawing room. And a small sitting room. Um, it's a fun house to explore because they really let you pretty much go anywhere. Um, it has an immense number of rooms, but most of them are visitable. And um, you can take your own, you can go at your own pace. It's not a guided tour, so you can spend as much time as you want in um, exploring each space. Um, this is the billiard room, which at one point was a brew house. Um, and after the fire, which occurred in the 19th century, uh, it was rebuilt um, as, um, as this billiard, billiard room. And this whole part of the house became a retreat with a number of things like billiard rooms, smoking rooms, card game rooms, and so forth that was really designed specifically for male entertaining. Um, I mentioned earlier the long hall. This is the inside of the long hall. Um, so this is original to the house from um, from uh, the 1500s and was originally paired in the opposite wing with a similar room, which no longer exists. Um, it's 115 feet long and was used as an art gallery and also a library. The ceiling is incredible. The pla it's, it's made of plaster and it is original um, and depicts scenes from the, uh, the book of Genesis. Um, they even have a display, uh, a specific exhibit about um, the, the making of this ceiling and its maintenance. You might wonder why it's a little dingy. Um, and there's a very specific reason for that. Um, you might think it would be easy to just slap a coat of white paint on it, which would make it a little nicer looking. And the reason they uh, can't do that is because um, it is so fragile that if they actually painted it, it would make it too heavy and it would be, <laughs> it would probably collapse. Um, but this, this hall is really beautiful. Um, they have sculptures and uh, paintings and also a fabulous collection of very early printed works, um, including, uh, I think 25 or 30 books um, printed before 1500, very, very early printed uh, materials. In other parts of the house, though, you get to really see the behind the scenes, the downstairs part of the house, which in many ways is uh, just as fascinating, if not more so. Here's a good example, again, of William Morris style arts and crafts wallpaper um, with the bells that allowed servants uh, to communicate with each other and with uh, the residents of the house. You can tour uh, most of the kitchen rooms, and there are, I think, something like 20 different kitchen-related rooms. Um, it's designed, uh, you can see here, the main kitchen was designed almost in the style of an old collegiate hall uh, with very high 
um, ceiling, win uh, very high ceilings and clerestory windows to let uh, light and air in and let heat and smoke out. Um, here's the meat larder on the right. There are any, I forget, it's somewhere between 20 and 25 uh, different specialized rooms in the kitchens. Um, so you can see where uh, there was a dairy, there was a pastry room, there was a, um, every single aspect of uh, food preparation had its own special uh, special location. This is the massive rotary cooking spit that could cook uh, many different um, meats or animals all at once at the same time. Uh, here's the dish drying area. A separate room for the bakehouse and pastry making. Um, way up in the attics, there was even a special room devoted uh, to traveling cases and suitcases. And because, of course, this was uh, even after the house was redesigned um, after the fire in the late 19th century, um, this was still before indoor plumbing really became a thing. Um, so there is an entire room up on the, uh, the bedroom floor upstairs called the sluice room, which um, is where bedpans from the different bedrooms were brought and they were... Uh, there was a, a sluice that ran from the second floor out into the back courtyards uh, to be run away um, and hosed out and washed away. Um, this gives you a better idea of the house. You can climb up into the, the woods behind it, um, and it shows the massive scale of this property. The attics um, are full of servants' rooms, um, so you can see, and you can visit those. You can see what their lifestyle was like, storage rooms and so forth. And the area over here on the right um, was devoted to uh, the nursery wing. So there were about 10 rooms specifically for children and the nannies who were taking care of them and educating them. Uh, there are 16 chimneys in this picture alone. <laughs> it's quite a place. Um, and there is a church attached to it, um, St. Hydrox, after which the property is named, um, from about the same time period, the mid-15th century, and several members um, of the household throughout the centuries are, are buried there. Um, the property is surrounded by about 22 acres of formal gardens that have, uh, there's a kitchen garden, there's a topiary garden, but then the parkland is hundreds and hundreds of acres. You can rent horses, you can walk. You could ride bicycles. Um, it's a gorgeous spot to visit. You could easily spend an entire day here, particularly if the weather is nice and you want to be outdoors. Um, here is a side view of the church and again, that long hall that we looked at. And because the property is so large, it is really protected from development. Um, so even when you get up high, you see nothing but beautiful um, Cornish countryside all around. Moving on a little bit further to the west, we stop in Truro, which is the capital of Cornwall. Um, it's very small, despite being the capital, it, it isn't actually that big a place, and it's completely dominated by its cathedral, as you can see here. Um, we stayed in this country house hotel. I treated myself for a couple of nights. It's called the Alverton, and was built as a private home in our house in 1830. Um, and sometime within the last, like, I think the early 20th century, it was converted into a nunnery. Um, and then later on in the late 20th century, it was turned back into a hotel. Um, it wasn't actually all that expensive considering how fancy it looks. Um, but we had quite an amazing room, very luxurious. That's the view from our bathroom. Um, we didn't, we weren't traveling with pets, but if you are, um, uh, the English love their pet dogs, um, so it's not uncommon to find places that are very welcoming to pets. 
Um, since this is an old manor house, it had its own attached chapel, just like Glen Hydrock did, and a great hall that you can see attached um, on the right. Now they use it for functions, so people get married there and they have conferences and so forth. Um, here's our room. Um, there was a very good restaurant on site, but it's also within walking distance of downtown Truro, which was kind of nice. Um, Truro is a, um, it's not always one of the highlights of Cornwall. People often kind of just zip through it, but it makes a very nice um, base if you're, uh, if you want to do day trips because Cornwall is so small um, in area and Truro is pretty much in the middle. So if you, if you based yourself in Truro, um, you can easily take day trips and never have to drive more than an hour in any direction to see many of the things in um, in Cornwall. And um, the town itself is very pleasant, has lots of restaurants and shops, um, and is a very nice-sized old British market town. Um, the cathedral, as I said, dominates the whole downtown because it's so huge, but it's actually not old. It was built in the early 20th century. They finished it in 1910. Um, it's in Gothic Revival style, um, but it does give Truro the feeling of a medieval cathedral town. And there's plenty of Victorian architecture. Here's the library. As a librarian, I always have to go to the, go to the public library. Um, Truro was originally a uh, center for the tin mining industry, um, and obviously that really doesn't exist anymore. So Truro has reinvented itself as just a pleasant market town and a, a tourist uh, tourist hub for people traveling um, in that part of Cornwall. There's some really nice old buildings, but it's not overly touristy compared to a lot of other places. Um, it, it, it doesn't have that overly touristed, Disneyfied feel that some other places might have. Um, it even has some funny little narrow passageways. Here's one called Squeeze Guts Alley. Um, and there's some nice little canals. Um, back to our hotel at night, the Alverton lit up in the evenings. So we used it as a base to visit a number of places in the area. Um, and on the South Coast, um, is this fun spot called Lizard Point. Um, you've probably heard of Land's End, which is the furthest possible west that you can go. And we did go there, except the weather was completely fogged in. So we decided not to bother staying there because you couldn't see a damn thing. Um, and if that's the case and you have an opportunity, I would actually recommend Lizard Point instead. Um, it is also an extreme. It isn't the furthest west, but it's the furthest south. It's the most southernmost point that you can get to in England. Um, and it's far less touristed um, than Land's End. So you're more likely to have, um, have the place pretty much to yourself. It's a beautiful rocky coastline, just like mu much of Cornwall. It's also home to the Lizard Point life Lifeboat Station, which you can see down below from 1914. There have been a lot of wrecks, as you might guess, along this rocky coastline over the years. So there's a lighthouse and uh, the life-saving station. Uh, but you can also do some really nice country walks um, along the coastline, along the tops of the cliffs, where you'll see um, lots of seabirds if you're interested in bird watching, and a lot of interesting plant life, which tends to be very short because um, it's, it's so windy and um, and gets all the sea spray that only very specific types of uh, durable plants um, can live along this kind of coastline. Lots and lots of seabirds. Um, and land birds too, here's a couple of magpies. Um, I recommend almost anywhere along the English coast for coastal walks because they're they're great for people who want a little bit of adventure, but may not want to go very far. Or if you have, if you aren't really up for very strenuous hiking, a lot of the coastal walks are pretty flat. You may be up high along the cliffs, 
Um, but there's not a lot of up and down. There's not a lot of rocky climbing. So you can see some pretty incredible coastline without necessarily being in fantastic shape to go mountain climbing. Um, you can also go only as far as you feel like. So if you just want to go down, walk a mile down and come back, um, you can do that. Or if you want, um, Britain has made a concerted effort to link most of its coastal walks. And in theory, if you felt like it, you could go almost all the way around the entire British Isles um, this way. But there's really, really beautiful scenery to see, particularly on a windy day when the surf is, is pounding. Um, if you're crossing fields, you do, like this one, you do have to watch out a little bit for the sheep and cow pies. Um, so watch your step. Um, a little further out from uh, Lizard Point is one of the other really big destinations in all of Cornwall, St. Michael's Mount, which is uh, very touristy again, but um, if you have a chance, you really shouldn't miss it. Um, it's in the middle of the very wide um, arms of the Bay of Penzance, and it's a counterpart uh, to Saint uh, to Mont Saint Michel in Normandy, although it's much much smaller. Um, if you if you're familiar with Mont Saint Michel, it is an abbey um, built off the coast of Normandy, um, and it's on the cover of every French uh, tourist guidebook. Um, Saint Michael's Mount is a similar kind of atmosphere; it just happens to be a lot smaller. Um, but um, it's it's an incredible place to visit. Um, and it looks back over to Penzance, um, as in the musical, The Pirates of Penzance. This is the town um, off in the distance. You can see the weather when we were there was um, pretty wild and windy. Um, and the mount is on a tidal island, which you can actually walk out to depending on the time of day that you're there and the tides. Um, there is a causeway that you can walk out to at low tide. Uh, obviously, this was not low tide, so we had to take a boat. Um, and the weather got so uh, windy that they actually, we were one of the last boats to get out before they stopped running them for the day because um, it just got a little bit too stormy. The boat takes only about five, 10 minutes tops because it's not that far off the coast. And it has a long history going back to a monastery like, like the one in France. Um, there was an actual monastery built on this rock, offshore rock, back in the 8th century. Uh, the castle and the chapel were built later, uh, mostly in the Middle Ages, and then completely rebuilt um, in a more romantic fashion in the 19th century. So when you get there, there's a little port that has some shops and houses. Um, at its height, about 200 years ago, there were a couple of hundred people living here on the island. Um, now um there's hardly anybody except those who are um, maintaining the shops um, and uh, the family that is connected with the castle um, victoria queen victoria did visit there in 1846 so you can see victoria regina where she, there's a little metal plaque where she stepped her delicate little foot off the boat and there's a nice view back um, to this small town of Marazion, which is um, just opposite. And you can kind of see, I'll, I'm not sure how much you can see it in this photograph, but there's a slightly um, light line in, um, in the water right here. And that is the submerged causeway, which you can take um, from Marazion, uh, Marazion oh, back um, over here. It's like a 10 minute walk or so um, if the tide is, uh, if the tide is out. So what you see here, which looks like a medieval castle, is actually mostly 19th century um, and very romanticized, but still very beautiful and a lot of fun to visit. This is another one of those places where if you're traveling with children, absolutely take them here because it's um, uh, it's a, a, a castle on an offshore island. It's perfect for kids. And uh, you can explore most of the castle. Most of the interior um, is visible, um, as well as the Church of St. Michael, which is connected to it. Um, here's the entrance up this uh, rocky set of steps and the Great Hall. 
and it is still home. Um, this uh, this is not it, while it is open to the public, it is still technically a private home, and it is has been owned by the St. Aubin family, who have lived here since the 17th century. Um, and parts of it are actually um, kind of like Land Hydrock. They're surprisingly small and homey um, for a castle. These are what are known as the blue drawing rooms. And from the top, there is uh, a very nice view. If the weather's nice, you can actually explore the gardens. They had actually closed them off the day we were there because um, the surf and the wind was so bad, they didn't want people clambering around on the rocks. But you could still see down um, to the gardens. Cornwall is influenced by the Gulf Stream, which is pretty, uh, pretty close. Um, to southern England, um, and that's why, uh, perhaps very surprisingly, when you think of what the climate in Britain usually is, this part of, of southern Britain is surprisingly warm, and um, you can actually see palm trees um, in the southern coast of Cornwall, um, and a wide variety of plants flourish there that you wouldn't necessarily expect. Um, the the castle is almost like it's kind of like being on a ship um there's all these uh, different levels that you can explore high above the ocean um and you really almost do feel like you're on on a giant ship cruising along the ocean with amazing views up and down the coast this is the entrance to the church here uh, which is the oldest part of the structure, goes back to about the 12th century. Uh, a little further down, uh, you can actually see uh, where we've gone further west and we're now looking back over the Bay of Penzance, looking back east where you can see the mount um, under what is increasingly unpleasant weather. Um, and we stopped in a little village called Mausel. It looks like Mausel, but it's pronounced Mausel. It also has a very long history, but now is mostly just a quaint fishing village arranged around this very well protected harbor. Um, lots of granite, as you can see. It's a big surfing spot. Very close to the uh, western tip of Cornwall, and there's lots of nice narrow little streets. It has a very New England feel. Um, if you if you are spend any time in Gloucester, Rockport, Newburyport. Um, where there have long been granite um, quarries and so forth. Um, this is similar geology um, in this part of England. So uh, much of the, um, the architecture is similar in style, built out of very strong, very sturdy looking granite, some of which gets whitewashed, like you can see here. Mausel is known for its annual festival. Um, which is supposedly the origin of stargazy pie, which we did not eat. Um, stargazy pie is, here's an image of it here, which has um, the actual fish baked into the pie with their heads and tails sticking out. That's why they call it stargazy, the fish are, it looks like the fish are looking up. Um, because uh, it, it is very traditional, but we actually had a lot of trouble finding stargazy pie anywhere because I think it's one of those things that um, it's a way of, freaking out the tourists, but people don't actually eat it, um, except maybe once a year when they have this festival. So you won't, you're, it's, you're very unlikely to find it on a restaurant menu or in a shop, um, but it is kind of fun to think about. Um, it started pouring rain, unfortunately, in Mausel, so we didn't spend too much time there, but it's still a very uh, pretty spot to stroll around. Um, and if the weather's cold like this, it's perfect for getting, um, ducking into a little tea house and getting a um, a cream tea to warm you up in the afternoon. Um, and now we're going to finish by heading uh, back towards the east again. We're making the tour. Um, and we stopped in a place called Gwenna Parish Church. This is a tiny, tiny little village. Um, known again for its parish church, which is considered to be one of the prettiest in all of Southeast England. 
um, I keep saying southeast, southwest. Um, it's de dedicated to St. Wenapa. And here's the interior. It's got a very old foundation um, going back centuries, but the current building that you're looking at um, is from the 1600s. And it's unusual in England in that the tower, the uh, the bell tower is separated from the main church building, which is not very common in England. Um, and like the one in St. Neot, um, it also has very, very nice stained glass and a very atmospheric graveyard. You'll often find in some of these small, out of the way uh, little places that um, you may be the only tourists there. A lot of people just don't bother to stop. Um, they go from one big site to another, but um, Cornwall is full of tiny little villages um, that are just incredibly beautiful, very atmospheric. The ones on the coast tend to be the ones that people visit the most just because of the dramatic coastline, um, but don't ignore the interior because it's it's very close by and there's just so much to see. Another of the big, uh, heading heading east once again, another of the um, most famous things to see and much more modern than what we've been looking at so far um, is the Eden Project. It's uh, not far from St. Austell, which is a, a kind of um, gritty uh, fishing town along the southern coast. Um, and it is one of the most popular botanical gardens in the British Isles. Um, in addition to dogs, you might know that um, Brits are fanatical about gardening. So there's uh, lots and lots of um, gardens in stately homes and also uh, public gardens and horticultural places to visit. This one was built um, on the site of an abandoned clay pit. Um, and it opened in the year 2000. Um, the reason they chose this location is because um, it had these already built because it was a it was essentially a, a place where they dug clay out of the ground so it had uh, had already a lot of nice uh, uh, pits um, which were perfect for nestling um, gardens uh, to be protected from uh, from the elements and they built these geodesic domes uh, interconnected ones covering two major biomes. They have um, tropical and Mediterranean, as well as a lot of outdoor gardens. Um, because the weather wasn't cooperating while we were there though, uh, we didn't spend too much time outdoors, uh, but there is so much to see inside. Um, you could easily spend an entire day uh, just inside um, the, the interior um, facilities. So it's a good place if the weather isn't cooperating, you can see plants um and uh enjoy not getting wet the domes are really they're they're much larger than they look from the outside and they allow for full-size trees like the palm trees that you can see here um, and extensive plantings at the top of the tropical one there's actually a catwalk that takes you to a viewing platform if you want where you can go way up high um, and see everything from the top there's also a really nice environmental education center that has um, exhibits about plant life and about ecology um, and um, a, a, a whole museum essentially of plant inspired art exhibits. This one is actually a 20 foot tall stone sculpture that's supposed to invoke a seed or a grain of pollen. And they also had this um, kind of weird installation that is um, intended to recall the cyanobacteria from which um, oxygen was first produced billions of years ago. Um, this is 25 feet tall, um, made of ceramic, and it periodically puffs out little rings of perfumed steam. So it's it's a kind of weird art thing, uh, but it is kind of fun when you think that it was inspired by the earliest um, uh, forms of life on the planet. And so there's not really actually this part of the uh, of the facility, it's all exhibit. There's there's no live plants. This is all art um, exhibits, and um, uh, it's more of a museum about ecology and about plant life. And then you can spend the rest of the day exploring uh, the incredible plant life um, 
under the domes. Um, there are extensive exhibits. There, uh, the informative signs are really well done. They explain not only about what, what the plants are and how they grow, uh, but also what they're used for. Many of the plants they have are um, have various kinds of medicinal or other uses. There's some wildlife, not a lot, but they have some um, fun birds that run around in the underbrush um, and lots of insects and butterflies and things like that. But um, if you're at all interested in gardens and botany, uh, it's it's one of the highlights, actually, of, of anywhere in England. It is uh, uh, a top 10 that kind of destination to visit if you're in this part of the country. There are plans. I'm not sure what the status is at this point, but there are plans to build a second project that's very similar way up in the north on the coast of Lancashire in the far north of England. I'm not sure what the status of that is. Um, and we're going to finish the program by just kind of uh, poking our way along the south coast back towards Devon. Um, this is, uh, I just liked this sign um, in this tiny little village where um, it's, there's something about Britain that I enjoy these kinds of things where they, they have very quaint, homey attitudes towards a lot of things um, where they ask that you contribute 50p and put it in the mill term, and they trust you. Um, there's a number of beautiful villages along the southern coast of Cornwall, um, Polpero, um, which is uh, a little village at the inlet of the mouth of the River Pole, which is where it gets its name, uh, is a very nice place to stop. Most of the places along this coast are, um, as you would imagine, they're fishing villages. Um, because that's what their history is. Um, although in addition to fishing, they also for many centuries um, made their income also from smuggling. So there's that part of the history as well. Um, Polpero um, is a very early town going back to the 1200s um, and was known for uh, its pilchard fishing um, and processing as well. Um, pilchards are a kind of herring, small kind of herring, uh, fish and um, you'll find here's here's a, a pub called the Three Pilchards in honor of that. Um, Polpero has a lot of um, uh, uh, whitewashed houses um, that are very pretty. Uh, it's a fairly quiet town. If you're there outside of the summer, it's swamped in the summer with tourists, um, and much of this part of Cornwall is. So we were there in late September, which is actually a nice time to be there. People, uh, families aren't traveling with kids at that time of year. The weather is still pretty pleasant, um, but you'll find it's um, the prices are a, a bit lower and it's nowhere near as crowded. And there's a bunch of narrow little uh, streets that wind through these very typical British village homes all the way down to the little harbor. Uh, we were there, as you can see, at low tide. <laughs> um, the tide is actually pretty substantial here. Um, and it was kind of fun to see what it looks like when when um, all the boats are stuck in the sand. Um, you'll notice that uh, the beginning of our trip was very sunny and very beautiful, and this part of our trip has been a little bit more gray. But I have to say, as long as you've got the right clothing um, and are have a bit of an open mind, um, Cornwall is beautiful in this kind of weather. Um, it's it is typical Cornish weather. So um, as long as you are kind of prepared for the fact that you might encounter this. Um, you can get uh, beautiful photographs in the fog and the mist. Um, and these are villages that, um, this isn't the south of France. They are designed to be in this climate. So um, they actually kind of look, they look normal um, when the weather is gray and, and cloudy. There's even a tiny little beach at the river uh, mouth right by the open ocean. And one very mean looking seagull. 
Um, a little further east, remember we're heading back towards Devon, um, another very old town um, uh, from the seventh century. This is called Foy, um, and it opens out into a very nice um, estuary uh, with a very wide harbor. Foy is a little bit uh, bigger and um, trendier than Bolpero, although its history kind of um, parallels it. Um, boat building, fishing, pilchards again um, here in Foy, and also um, smuggling at various points in its history, but it's a bit bigger. Um, there's a parish church over here on the right, um, and at left, uh, the left here is an old uh, private mansion called Place House, but um, it's privately owned. Um, lovely town, again, just to kind of stroll around. Um, Foy has more of a seaside feel um, and more of a Georgian feel. You can see a lot of these houses are obviously more recent. They're from the 18th and 19th centuries, and they have um, a Georgian style and the pretty colors that are typical of that era, um, the um, pastel colors that give it more of a seaside feel. And here's the, the river mouth. Um, on the opposite side is a separate town called Poruan. Um, you can take a ferry over or, or drive across a bridge further up, um, but um, it's a beautiful place to stroll around. And again, um, at this time of year, when the weather can be a little chilly, you definitely want to stop in um, the afternoon and have some soup, or have some homemade bread, have scones and tea. Um, or a Cornish pasty. There's some other different ones, all different kinds, bacon, cheese, steak, vegetables, cheese and onion, cheese and bacon. Um, another one, uh, a little further down, is called uh, Lou. It's actually the Lou's. There's uh, two of them, one on the east and one on the west uh, side of the River Lou. There are um, jokes about Lou, of course, because um, Lou is is British slang for a for a toilet, and I think they're kind of Lou avoids that, and I think they they're kind of missing a tourist opportunity to capitalize on the humor of being called Lou. Um, but it's another town that has lots of little stone, whitewashed stone coastal houses with hilly streets. Um, here's the Lou gift shop. Um, nowadays, again, this is mostly a tourist town. Um, it still does fish, um, um, but probably more tourism than anything else. Lots of shops and pubs. Um, here we're looking across to East Lou. Um, being Britain, they even had public loos, and I thought they were really missing the opportunity to have big signs that said, you know, Lou loos, but they didn't. They're probably sick of people making the joke. Um, East Lou has a very nice sandy beach, which is um, pretty big for uh, this stretch of coastline. Um, and again, it's a place where you can start some really nice coastal walks up and down. And I'm going to finish up um, with one last um, stately home, which uh, I would also recommend just because it's it's quite different from a lot of the other places that you might visit. Um, it's called Cotil, which you wouldn't necessarily guess from the spelling. Um, and it's important uh, because it is one of the least altered houses from its time period, which is the Tudor period in Britain. It goes um, as early as the eight, uh, as the 1300s. Much of the house that you see is from a century later in the 1400s, but um, it is fairly early for this kind of home. And unlike a lot of others, which have been electrified and upgraded um, either by the National Trust or by uh, previous owners throughout the centuries, this one is pretty much like it used to be. So uh, it's, it's a little bit more authentic and gives you a good idea 
of uh, a better idea of what life really would have been like to live in a house in this time period. The display of apples that you see out front is just because of the time of year that we were there, they were having an orchard festival. Um, the house does have a, an orchard with about 250 apple trees. Um, so there were some outside activities going on related to that while we were there. Um, it's a big property, 1300 acres. Um, it goes all the way down to the river Tamer um, and it is the ancestral home of the Edgecombe family for several centuries. It's made of the local granite and local slate um, built around a central courtyard. Um, one wing was remodeled in the 19th century, but the majority of the house, as I said, that that's this wing here, the majority of the house um, is still pretty much as it was um, six, 700 years ago. Here's the Great Hall. Um, they also have an excellent collection of um, uh, decorative arts, uh, furniture, um, uh, silver, household objects, uh, costumes, all kinds of things like that. So if you're interested not only in the architecture, um, but furnishings as well, they have um, a very, very nice display of that. Um, tapestries, all kinds of things. Um, there are here's one of several bedrooms. Um, and again, this is a wonderful way to see um, a, a glimpse of life during that time period. Um, it's fairly dark inside, so uh, because they haven't done a lot of electrifying, so um, you will actually see it um, as it would have been pre <laughs> pre light bulb. This is actually a, a dining room, a combination dining room, drawing room. Um, another of the bedrooms and the stained glass in the chapel. Most houses from this time period, of course, had their own chapels inside. And like the other um, uh, property I showed you, this also has a very good display of the sort of backstairs, downstairs life. Um, and it's also interesting because whereas Len Hydrock shows you the upstairs downstairs of the 19th century, this shows you the same version of that um, during the Tudor time period, which is obviously very different much earlier. So you can see a Tudor kitchen and a lot of the different ways that they would have managed um, a property during that time period. Um, it's nestled kind of down and underneath a slope, so it has a very gloomy, haunted feel. Particularly on a gray day like this. This northwest tower that you see in the back um, is um, the tallest and the earliest part of the house. It also has some wonderful gardens. Um, most of which were um, more recent um, than the original property. But there's a kitchen garden. This is all on the east side of the house that was uh, redone uh, more recently in the 19th century. And I will finish by um, saying that um, the next program that kind of continues on from this is the one I have on Devon, which is the, the county immediate, larger county immediately to the east. Um, and unfortunately, we did not have the time to stop in the town of Splat. I would have loved to um, visit Splat just to say I'd been there and get a picture of the sign. Um, you probably know Britain is full of, um, at least to our ears, very funny sounding town names. Um, and that makes it kind of fun to wander around. Um, find yourself a good map, um, get a car, and explore the countryside. It's a, it's a great way of seeing um, England. And I will finish there. Um, this is actually in Devon, um, showing once again how the Brits love their dogs which is great for me because I'm a dog person. It's nice to see dogs pretty much everywhere you go. So that's the end of today's presentation. I'm going to stop my share. Um, 
And let me just take a quick look at, did I miss any questions? Let me do the, the Q&A first, then I'll go back to the chat. To my New England ear, how well could I understand the Cornish accent? Oh, it was fine. Um, I didn't, I wouldn't even say I noticed a Cornish accent, um, at least um, a strong enough accent to be different from, um, to be different from other British accents around the country. Um, so no, I, I certainly didn't have any trouble understanding people, that's, that's for sure. Um, someone says, I noticed in your picture of Floyd that the telephone booth was blue. Yes, I, I noticed that as well. And I don't know if there's a reason for that. Most phone booths, um, uh, phone boxes in Britain are, are um, red, as you know. Um, I don't know if it was any specific reason. I'd have to look that up. My guess, uh, if I had to hazard a guess, is that everything in Floyd was blue. Um, that seemed to be the official color of the town. So lots of people had painted their um, their house shutters blue, and a lot of the doors were blue. So maybe they just painted their uh, the thing blue because just because. Um, but I'm not actually sure of that. Um, I don't actually know about whitewashing. Um, it certainly is decorative. Um, whitewashing is traditional not only in Britain but in many cultures um uh in europe and i think um probably there is a certain degree of um protection of the stone um, it is something you have to do fairly frequently um but if you have a stone house that um may uh attract uh, moisture through the cracks and the mortar um this is something else i'd have to look up i could always get back to you on that but my my understanding is that a lot of um, whitewashing is simply to protect the stone um, from the elements. Also, um, uh, I, I know in certain parts of the world, particularly in the southern Mediterranean, it's a way of keeping your house cool because it's reflective. Um, that probably isn't anywhere near as important in a place like Cornwall. Um, and someone asked about the bushes shaped like urns. Um, is there a significance to the shape? Not, not specifically. Um, it, a lot of the topiary has to do with just the what the owners wanted and what kind of trees uh, lend themselves to particular shapes. Um, so the uh, land hydrock just had trees that um, for centuries they have had these trees that look like big uh, sort of eggplant shaped uh, vases with a flat top that's just the way they've been for, for ages um, um you know i've never watched doc martin um someone uh someone is asking if i know where in cornwall cornwall the tv series was filmed but if you can whoops if you can hold on for one quick second i could look it up Let's see. Let's take a quick look. Um, it looks like it has been filmed in a number of places um, in Cornwall, including um padstow st ives which we drove through but did not um spend time in because it was torrentially raining um it was filmed in foy it was filmed in falmouth st michael's mount um a number of places padstow and fort isaac we went by but didn't actually stop in um it looks like it's also been filmed in devon and Dartmoor and Lyme Regis and some places like that. If you if you Google Doc Martin filming locations, you'll see a lot of places listed. Um, but of the places we visited today, really the only ones were um, Foy and St. Michael's. Um, oops, I lost the Q&A. Um, and uh, the last one in the Q&A is, is Merlin's Cave at Tintagel natural all the way through? Yes, it is. 
um, that is an entirely natural cave um, that just goes through the um, the underneath of the the big uh, headland. You can walk all the way through as long as the the tide is out. Um, and now let me go back to the chat. Um, what have I missed? Smuggling was smuggling consistent, or did it change over time? Um, my thinking is wine, but maybe incorrect. Um, not sure. Um, smuggling died out probably in the early mid nineteenth century, maybe, um, and a lot of it was pretty. Um, a lot of it was pretty unpleasant and violent. Um, the idea being that people would lure ships, falsely lure them with um, with lanterns onto the coastline and then um, either uh, either the the people on the on the boats were either drowned um, or killed. Um, and then the goods, which could be any number of things from a ship, uh, were taken and sold or used. Um, but I would actually kind of like to read a, a nonfiction book about the, about smuggling in that area because there's so much fictionalized versions of that that it's kind of hard to know how much of that is is real. Um, if you want a fictionalized version, uh, Jamaica Inn is definitely uh, a good place to start. Um, someone's asking about Lands End. Yes, it is very touristy. Um, is it so touristy as to be in a place to avoid? No. If you're there on vacation, sure, stop there. I, I wouldn't stay overnight there. I wouldn't spend a lot of time there, but the views are gorgeous. Um, uh, it, yeah, it's it's cheesy touristy, um, but so what? So, so is Cape Cod. Um, that doesn't mean you shouldn't stop there and visit. I don't think I would plan a lot of time there. Um, and the thing about Land's End is everybody goes there because it's the furthest west point. Um, but honestly, the the coastline and the the natural beauty of the place is not that much different from the rest of the Cornish coastline. So um, most people go there just to be able to say, I went all the way to the end. Um, but there are so many other places. Lizard Point is, is an excellent example where you can see something that looks as beautiful as Land's End. It just isn't as far west. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Lots of people. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Someone's raising a glass of a cup of tea for me. Um, I'm actually, I'm actually drinking drinking Cipro right now, which is a um, a Greek aperitif. So yeah, I'm far more likely to drink that than tea. Um, someone mentioned St. Ives and Port, Port Isaac. Yes, yeah, St. Ives, we drove through St. Ives. And the only reason we didn't stop and spend more time there, I'd love to go back. Um, it's an absolutely gorgeous town. Um, but unfortunately, the traffic was horrendous when we were in St. Ives because there was some sort of event going on. And um, it was also torrentially raining. So we just said, forget it, we'll, we'll go somewhere else someday. Um, someday I'll try to go back when when it isn't quite like that. Um, thank you. Any more questions? I guess that's it. Okay. Um, I, think, I think so, Jeff. So I think I've covered I wanna, all the questions. Yep. Yeah. So, folks, uh, if you haven't already, let Jeff know in the chat how much you enjoyed today's presentation. Uh, we're going to be with Jeff on Wednesday, October 5th at 7 o'clock. So it's a nighttime one. We're partnering with Chumsford. Uh, Jeff's going to take us to Transylvania. So that's Wednesday, October 5th, 7 o'clock. And then we're back to our uh, regular uh, Tuesday at 2 uh, on Tuesday, November 22nd. So Tuesday, November 22nd, 2 o'clock. Uh, I'm going to mispronounce this. Uh, Central France. Uh, Dor how, am I, how am I pronouncing this? The Dordogne. 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 Uh, I'm going to work on that for two Never months. Never mind. I'll, I'll do it. 
I'll get it right. Okay, you'll do it for me. So uh, we'll be going to France on Tuesday, November 22nd uh, at two o'clock with Jeff. So look for that information in your email tomorrow, along with the feedback survey and recording. Uh, Jeff, any last words? Um, again, just uh, I will once again put my uh, email in in case you missed it. Um, oops. Email.com. Um, Feel free to email me if you have any other questions or if I missed anything about this program or about travel in general. I'm always happy to talk to people about their travel questions and experiences. So um, feel free to contact me and I'm glad you enjoyed it. And I hope to see you in first week in October. Transylvania is so much fun. Um, everybody always wants to do that in October because it's October and it's Halloween and all that. But Transylvania is so much more than Dracula. <laughs> I can't tell you how much. It's a beautiful place. And I'm looking forward to sharing that with you. All right. Well, thanks so much, Jeff. And uh, thanks okay. to the Ashland Library and the Friends of the Tewksbury Public Library for helping make today's event possible. Thank you all. See you soon. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you.